I've got just a host of material up here to try to go over in a relatively short amount of time, but uh, thank you very much for uh, having me here, number one. Um, the lighting up here, by the way, is terrible, so I'm going to have to hold this closer to me because I can't even see it down here on the uh, podium. In uh, 1975, uh, an organization calling itself United Churches of Florida uh, moved into Clearwater. Its, its representatives uh, paid cash for the Port Harrison Hotel, and the community was excited about the prospects of a group uh, which was a coalition of, uh, they thought, a coalition of Christian churches uh, coming into uh, Florida and into Clearwater, uh, holding conventions uh, and helping to revitalize downtown. Uh, however, Mayor uh, Gabe Casares was, was the first one to discover the truth about who this really was. Outraged, he announced to a stunned community that the United Ch Churches of Florida did not exist. It was really the Church of Scientology who had bought the beloved Port Harrison Hotel. A press release issued uh, by the Church of Scientology spokesman uh, Artie Marin attempted to downplay the significance of their having purchased this property under false pretenses. And in that press release he said, well, I hope the mayor can put an end to his concern that the city of Clearwater is being taken over by mafia hoods." Un unquote. As Mayor Casares would discover to his part, the city of Clearwater had been taken over by something even worse, a ruthless criminal cult with totalitarian aspirations. The press release went on to say, uh, to explain rather grandiosely, that United Churches of Florida was Scientology's answer to gigantic government, huge international corporations, and a dominated media. Quote, we want the churches of the United States and eventually the world to unite as a force within society, to change our world for the better, to unite as one voice on social matters of present day concern. 25 years later, there is indeed a matter of grave present day concern but it is not what the extravagant words of this press release intended. For former Mayor Gabe Casares and for all of us here at this conference, that concern is the continuing relentless takeover of a sizable American city by the cult that calls itself the Church of Scientology. Back in uh, <clears throat> 1977 when, when uh, the U.S. government <coughs> raided uh, the Church of three offices of the Church of Scientology, among those uh, 48,600 documents that they seized from these three locations uh, was uh, information about how the church planned to take over the city of Clearwater, Florida in Project Normandy. Uh, <clears throat> Mayor Casares at the time, as you know, uh, uh, fought fiercely against this organization. Gabe Casares is very much involved in this organization today called the Lisa McPherson Trust, which we have set up in downtown Clearwater. Uh, you know, two days ago I met with Gabe, and these were his three pages of handwritten notes uh, for our little uh, powwow about uh, things we needed to do in, in Clearwater to, uh, particularly over the course of the next six months, to try to keep this ultimate takeover that Scientology plans for Clearwater under check, or in check. Uh, to give you an idea of the present day atmosphere in Clearwater, on uh, February the 24th, uh, Stacy Brooks, who is the president of the Lisa McPherson Trust and I, met with uh, Mike Roberto, who is the city manager in Clearwater, uh, together with Pam Aiken, Clearwater's city attorney. And we went uh, there in an, in an effort to uh, continue an education process uh, of Mr. Roberto in terms of uh, who the organization was that the city of Clearwater had decided to cozy up to uh, rather closely, in our opinion, and rather dangerously. Well, Mr. Roberto uh, said to us that he spent the last two years since he came to Clearwater as city manager trying to get the Church of Scientology off the front pages of the local newspapers in uh, Tampa, St. Pete. And boom, the Lisa McPherson Trust comes to Clearwater in January year 2000 and 
the Church of Scientology is back on the front pages of the local newspaper. The city of Clearwater doesn't like that. Mr. Roberto said that is bad for business. It is bad for economic development in Clearwater. It is bad for development of the uh, bayfront that they have in downtown Clearwater. And he said every time that your organization's conflict with Scientology spills over and affects the business community in this town, we are going to do everything we can to shut you down. Now, Mr. Roberto didn't mean shutting down the organization specifically, he meant shutting down whatever those activities were. And the city of Clearwater, as any city in the United States, uh, has a very, very broad range of possibilities to curtail activities that uh, of any nature, and especially when it regards something called a church. Um, there's, uh, I would refer you to uh, a Cornell Law Review uh, article in November 1999 if you want to get an idea of the types of laws and the, the way the courts in this country are moving towards picketing uh, near or around churches. Uh, there's some pretty chilling uh, things in there, pretty chilling weapons that, that uh, communities or cities uh, have to fight people who are uh, protesting the activities of of an organization like the Church of Scientology. Well, basically, Mr. Roberto's uh, message was that, you know, moral crusaders are not welcome in Clearwater. Uh, he suggested that perhaps uh, Los Angeles or Washington or Boston or even Dunedin would be a better place for us to be. Uh, in fact, he said, you know, the city manager in Dunedin is a very close friend of mine. I could get you waterfront property there if you prefer, <laughs> rather than your location next to the Church of Scientology's Clearwater Bank building. Well, <clears throat> Mr. Uh, Roberto went on to explain that uh, the city of Clearwater had spent a lot of money over 20 years investigating the Church of Scientology, uh, and they never even uh, wrote them a parking ticket. Uh, he said the federal government wasn't interested, the FBI, you know, passed, passed the buck. They weren't interested after the 1977 raids and the 1980 convictions. You know, after that it was over as far as they were concerned. So, Mr. Roberto said, why should the city of Clearwater devote any money into this effort? To, you know, they even instructed this, the Clearwater Police Department from October last year they can no longer gather any intelligence information on Scientology and its activities in the community. It's, you know, talking about making a deal with the devil. I mean, the, the new management in Clearwater has literally started to make a deal with the devil because it's good for business. If Scientology is not on the front pages of the paper, Perhaps we can make uh, the, the city of Clearwater grow. We can have developers come in and build uh, high-rise condominiums all along the uh, waterfront. Uh, and, you know, before it's over, it'll look like the, uh, the coast of Spain, in the touristy part, anyway. Um, this, this was a fairly discouraging uh, response that to uh, we got from Mr. Roberto and the city attorney. But uh, we told him that, you know, it really isn't the public sector's responsibility to fight organizations like this. It is a private sector responsibility. And we, the Lisa McPherson Trust, should be embraced by the public sector for what we're here trying to do, to educate this community about what Scientology is. When we opened our doors on uh, January the 5th, we, we started getting calls immediately from citizens of Clearwater talking about their concerns about Scientology, about how happy they were that we were there, about how they were, they were, they always looked at Scientology with some sort of mysterious shroud over it, that they were invited to community events, many Scientologists to, uh, you know, they, they have a practice of going around and speaking to various community groups. And they said when we ask questions, they never answer our questions. 
you know, they give us a runaround when we ask the questions. We'd really like to know. We'd like for somebody to honestly answer questions about what Scientology is. And, you know, I explained to them that we have uh, a number of former Scientologists uh, working here at the Lisa McPherson Trust who will be glad to sit down and answer each and every question you have. Uh, however, the one interesting aspect of the, uh, the people that we have talked to in Clearwater who uh, not only call, but they, they particularly the first uh, few weeks we were there, they were coming in uh, into the office just to say hello, to introduce themselves, to offer to volunteer. We do have a small staff of volunteers now who are manning the phones, doing scanning, uh, you know, all sorts of extraordinarily useful things that none of us uh, seem anymore to have the time to do because we spend a lot of time on the phone. But <clears throat> the one thing about these people in Clearwater is they are frightened of Scientology. They live in a community, it's roughly 100,000 people in Clearwater, I think there's uh, 74,000 300 registered voters, and they genuinely have a fear of the Church of Scientology. You know, a lot of people who call say, you know, look, uh, I'm having to call you from a payphone because I don't want to, any phone record of, or anything on my bill that I've talked to anybody at Lisa McPherson Trust, because we're afraid of the recriminations that uh, Scientology might pull on us. We've had, volunteer, we've had people come in from the community who picketed with us down in Clearwater, uh, who have volunteered to do work with us. And for example, one family, uh, a husband, a wife, and a child that came, uh, they, they spent considerable time with us learning more about Scientology. They picketed with us several times. And what happens next? Uh, I mean, they helped us also with our brochures with the guys in uh, graphic arts. Uh, they helped us with the brochures and things of that nature. And then what happens next uh, is a group of Scientologists come to their neighborhood and start going around asking questions about the husband and the wife. And believe me, that type of thing has a chilling effect on somebody's commitment to getting involved in a battle against the Church of Scientology. I mean, they do extract a heavy price from anybody who is willing to stand up and actively criticize them. And there are plenty of people in this room that you can ask who have experienced that, the, the wrath of the Church of Scientology. Now, just to, before I go into the, the next aspect here, I want to talk about Scientologists a little bit. I mean, uh, at least 95% of Scientologists are totally wonderful, good, decent people. Maybe even 100%. But certainly the 95% that I run across on a regular basis are incredibly nice, decent people. It is a very, very small group of people within the Church of Scientology who are aspiring totalitarian leaders. They have they run this organization in a, in a Nazi-like manner. They intimidate people into doing, uh, they intimidate people into being controlled so incredibly significantly, it's beyond belief to me. But we have one of the most surprising things about what we've been doing at the Lisa McPherson Trust is we're talking to a lot of current Scientologists. We're not talking with many Sea Org people, because this is the you know the paramilitary wing, the the, the very very uh, highly uh, conditioned group within the Church of Scientology who is very hard to get through to. But the public Scientologists have been out there on the internet for several years, and many of these people have come come and talked to me and said. You know, we would have never ever thought about uh, speaking to Bob Minton, but we have followed your activities, we have followed the critics' activities, and the uh, the conflict really between the Church of Scientology and the Internet over the last three or four years, and it has given them uh, 
enough strength and courage to actually come out and talk to one of the most evil people on the planet. <laughs> and, you know, I think this is a, a, a really big accomplishment. And we've only been in Clearwater for uh, uh, two and a half months. And to be talking, and not just, when I say I'm, we're talking with current Scientologists, we're not talking with low-level Scientologists. We have talked with some of those as well. But we're talking to people who have reached the height of Scientology's bridge to total freedom. OT8s, OT7s, you know, these are people who have been in Scientology for 15, 20 years. They are leaders in the Clearwater community of Scientologists, in the field, the Scientology field, as they call it, in Clearwater. <coughs> These people don't like the totalitarian aspects of Scientology. They are finding out that they don't have to put up with it. They are finding out that there is possibilities to get all of their money back. We are helping people get $700,000 back, $600,000 back, $300,000 back, from the Church of Scientology. This, this is a money machine. It is a money machine. They are stealing people's money. You know, we, we sit and we listen to stories from a, a lady whose husband died. She's an elderly lady. She had children in Scientology. She got involved to be closer to the children. The husband dies, he has a lot of money. The Reg for Scientology comes to her house the night her husband dies and will not leave until he gets the $700,000 that he already knows the husband is giving the wife. And he got it. But this lady is getting it back. She is tired, she was tired of being ripped off by Scientology. We are in Clearwater to make sure that the people of Clearwater learn about the true nature of this organization, about the abusive and deceptive practices that Scientology uh, gets away with on its own members. And we are there to help Scientologists get their money back, help them with their divorce situation, with their spouse who is still remaining in Scientology and the, the, the father or the mother wants to leave. We have. We have mothers calling us about their, cust their child custody cases where the father is now, because of the Scientology, she, you know, she fell into a trap, this one particular woman, she fell into this trap of letting the Scientology judicial system help them solve their uh, divorce cases, uh, their divorce case and then their child custody case. The mother is now no longer has any visitation privileges with her own child because her Scientology friends abandoned her they were the ones who were allowed to, the only ones who were allowed to do supervised court, uh, supervised visits, custody. Uh, you know, she had to have some supervision when she visited as a result of this arrangement that they worked out with the Church of Scientology's justice system. Well, people are getting fed up with it. Scientologists are getting fed up with it. Uh, I guarantee you, I'm fed up with it. I would, I would like nothing better than to be doing something else other than uh, fighting with the Church of Scientology. But they are ruining people's lives. They are, I mean, our conference here is about human rights. Scientology deprives its members of human rights. Every Scientologist has a right to believe in the Scientology technology if that's what they want to believe in. But the Church of Scientology does not have the right to abuse people's human rights, to attack everyone who speaks out against them, and it has to stop. And the Lisa McPherson Trust is just uh, one more in a long line of uh, organizations who have, and people who have been fighting Scientology and will continue to fight Scientology until this organization reforms as best it can to the norms of society. and I would be happy to take any questions that anyone has. Well, uh, Lisa, Steve asked about Lisa McPherson. 
anybody who would prefer to write their questions, that's fine, or you can stand up and ask them openly if uh, you don't have any problems with that. Bob, we, we prefer to have the questions written. Oh, okay. That's okay. Yeah, that's fine. Well, can I just go to that one? Sure. Pete wanted to ask. Yeah. Yes. Um, as you know, uh, the there have been several interesting developments in the Lisa McPherson case. Uh, one of the one of the interesting developments was a couple of months ago. Uh, the local Scientologist in Clearwater gave to us the form letter that they were asked to complete uh, by Kendrick Moxon. He was the one coordinating this thing, uh, who is one of their uh, in-house uh, attorneys who handles, uh, you know, any situation where they need a, a shady attorney. <laughs> well, Moxon uh, sent out this form letter to Scientologists in Clearwater and asked them to basically sort of fill in the blanks and sign an affidavit that, that as a result of the Lisa McPherson case, these, uh, uh, these local Scientologists, their businesses were affected, their relationships with their family was affected, that they were uh, being persecuted as a result of the state of Florida prosecuting the Church of Scientology about the death of Lisa McPherson. Well, we got those early on. Uh, you know, we know that those things were also delivered to the prosecutor. We posted them on the internet. Uh, and sure enough, uh, last week, I guess it was, uh, 200 uh, letters were delivered to the prosecutor from uh, Scientologists who had been damaged severely as a result of the prosecution of the Lisa McPherson case. And this was all part of the church's attempt to have the state of Florida drop its uh, charges against Scientology because of the, the, the religious persecution that was occurring. Well, uh, we'll see what happens on that. Uh, nobody knows what will happen on that, but I doubt that they're going to drop their, prose their prosecution of the case. The, the other thing of significance that happened was that uh, uh, Joan Wood, the medical examiner, changed her uh, the results of the autopsy uh, there were four possible causes of death to be listed on that autopsy, and there were uh, homicide, suicide, uh, accidental, or unexplained. Those were the only four possibilities. Previously, the uh, autopsy report had said unexplained, and it was changed to accidental. Uh, that's really all. I mean, you know, the... the the dehydration question uh, was somewhat put down on the revised autopsy report, but the in terms of a major cause of death. But all of the tests that have been done subsequently at the request of the Church of Scientology have shown have uh, upheld the original medical results in terms of analyzing the vitreous fluid. Uh, two subsequent tests were done and both of those were uh, the same or slightly higher than the original test. So the dehydration factor is still very clear there. You know, Scientology trotted out a couple of its uh, medical experts, uh, one of which is a guy named Cyril Wecht, who was uh, responsible for doing the autopsy on the uh, alien at Roswell, New Mexico. Uh, you might remember he was also on the O.J. Simpson team. And basically, you can buy any medical opinion you want in this country uh, if you're prepared to pay high enough price to get them to uh, look at it the way you want. And sure enough, they did. And uh, the medical examiner, after three years of being bombarded by the Church of Scientology and its medical experts, did change the, the opinion. Uh, not significantly, and I don't think it will affect the criminal case. It certainly won't uh, affect the civil case. So, you know, the civil case, uh, uh, with any uh, luck, will go to trial sometime this uh, fall. Oh, so, here's some more so, questions. Some of those were maybe for Steve. I didn't actually explain this so much. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, here's uh, from our... Uh, this could be from our Scientology friends, 
given the, the question, but it's a good question. Why is the Lisa McPherson Trust a for-profit company? It's a really good question. The Lisa McPherson Trust is a for-profit corporation in Florida because we do not wish to be transparent in terms of who supports our organization, uh, and that's the basic reason. You know, we, there, how, how is it possible for us to make money? We don't even charge people that we help get their money back from the Church of Scientology for it. It's a pleasure to help them for free. So we don't want our uh, donor list to be visible to the Church of Scientology. Uh, the Church of Scientology is already trying in court cases to uh, have us, three times they've tried so far to have us uh, put forward our financials to the Church of Scientology's attorneys and it hasn't happened and I doubt that it ever will. And I should just say that uh, in the first printing of the book, we're going into a second printing, I, uh, I, er I made an error and wrote that it was non-profit. So in the next printing it will be corrected, lest anybody accuse me of deceptively uh, representing it. Uh, representing the situation. It was just uh, a deep time when, before you were incorporating, I thought it was going to be non-profit. Yeah. Non -profit. Did you actually make a reference to it as being non-profit? I did, in the footnotes. Oh, okay. I didn't realize that, and I actually... actually did. Okay, I didn't realize that. Well, that's why I'm correcting it publicly. Okay. Yeah. It's my fault. It's my error. Well, it's my fault, really, because uh, our intentions were to make it a non-profit corporation, but then when we got into all the intricacies of that and we saw what the filing requirements were, we decided that uh, a for-profit would be uh, a better way to keep uh, intelligence away from the Church of Scientology. Right. There was also a, a typo in your email address, too. But. Yeah. He's, he's forgiven, okay? All is forgiven. It's Lisa McPherson Trust, or lisamcpherson.org, if you want more information about this case. Uh, you know, yeah. there's, there's a lot more that Bob hasn't said. You presupposed everyone knew about the substance of her being held for 17 days. She repeatedly asked to be let out, wasn't let out, was given all kinds of treatment that, that they are saying were religious when in fact they were medical. When yes. she was brought to the hospital, they bypassed several hospitals. Yes. I mean, there's a lot of factual things here of great concern. Well, I, I would hope that uh, most people here know something about this Lisa McPherson case, but one, uh, one interesting aspect of this case that's that I've noticed recently is the prosecutors uh, in their uh, most recent significant memorandum to the court, uh, you know, the Church of Scientology has said all along that this woman was on a, uh, uh, a religious, she was getting religious services. Well, in the depositions that uh, all the Scientologists first gave and then secondly, uh, changed after they were given immunity from prosecution and, it, and admitted lying under oath. Uh, it's now confirmed that Lisa McPherson was not under any sort of religious treatment of any kind. They were trying to get her onto this introspection rundown, but she wasn't able to do any auditing and therefore uh, they couldn't even start her on, on this thing. So one of the interesting aspects of that is that the Church of Scientology tried to get the court to rule that Scientology was a religion. The court said, you know, what, what does that have to do with anything? We don't want to, it's not our issue to, to decide whether you're a religion. And basically, Mr. Dandar in the civil case has gone, you know, very hard on this with the help of uh, attorneys in California to basically say that if she wasn't getting any religious services, what does the issue of religion have at all to do with this case? And I think that that will, the judge has seen that, that that is not a factor here and has declined to rule on that issue at all. Should I do this one? Sure. I'm not going to read the entire question because it's very long, but it's what, what, what hope can you offer to a family whose son is in a one-on-one -on -one domination relationship and such, and the family has tried a lot of different things? Well, one of the, one of the uh, hallmarks of of my approach that I'm, I'm uh, promoting, the strategic interaction approach, is to create a team of concerned people. 
uh, whether it's other siblings, cousins, former high school coaches, uh, ministers, whoever uh, cares about the person, and in, in, educate them and encourage them to create a relationship or start up a relationship again with the individual. Sometimes, um, in, especially in, in small groups or one-on-one -on -one groups, uh, the whole family is cut off, but if it was a, a, a former uh, co-worker or, or a friend or whatever, and it's not perceiving to be just attacking the relationship, something can take place. Um, I try to think very practically about what little steps can be taken to move forward to the goal. And the goal is to help empower people to have choice and to, and to grow and to learn. And um, sometimes in, in, track, in these attractive case, uh, protracted cases that go on and on, and there seems to be no movement, any movement is some movement. And I've actually suggested in some cases for a family member or a friend to approach whoever is the agent of influence, whoever is the dominator or the controller, and ask for their help. Um, which is, you know, shocking, because they're the ones who are creating the problem. However, typically the person who's doing, doing the controlling, they think they're righteous in their control. They think they're justified in their control. And so if, if, if an approach is made, and, and again, it has to be done strategically, but an approach is made to say, hey, I know you care about him or her, um, help us. Uh, maybe the family is having counseling, please come to the family counseling. Let's create a dialogue. Yeah. Something that moves the case forward as opposed to just doing nothing and, and, and hoping. Um, the other side of it is, is what um, this call for action. And, and you are an epitome of someone who never had a cult problem yourself, but you saw the, the destruction that was being now, done. I <laughs> but you saw the destruction, you said, I've got to do something about this, and I can do something about it, and therefore I will do something about it. Every cult member you ever meet is somebody's son or daughter. It's somebody's brother or sister, somewhere. And some family, somewhere else in the world, maybe it's a, a Japanese family whose loved one was shipped over to the U.S., 20 years ago, and uh, and they're now inviting you to come to a unification event. They're somebody's daughter, and you have a chance to talk to them. At least whatever moments you have, and make a connection and let them know that the outside world isn't evil and that uh, everyone isn't against them. And, and talk with them and ask them about them, what they want and what their hopes and their dreams are. And, and do something that can create a bridge. And I'm hoping also for those families who, are, who have, don't know where their kids are and they haven't for years, with the internet we can post pictures and we can keep our eye out. For, especially some, some of these cults where the names are changed and they disappear, the garbage eaters and such, the Jim Roberts group. We can try to create networks of people who are concerned and we really can make an effort to reach out and help. So those are a few thoughts. Just, uh, we're remodeling our uh, building down in Clearwater, and we're going to have an all-glass front uh, on both sides of the building. There's a central hallway, and both sides will be all glass. And one of the purposes of that is to uh, allow, particularly on one side, for people to, to be able to see, and anybody who walks by that building, we'll have a, we'll have a real L. Ron Hubbard life exhibit. I don't know if anybody's <laughs> ever seen an L. Ron Hubbard life exhibit in uh, Los Angeles. But we'll tell the true story. We'll have original material from the Church of Scientology there. We are already building a substantial archive. If somebody wants to see a real document uh, in L. Ron Hubbard's handwriting, we've got them. They can come look at them. They can find out what the truth is about this man uh, that they so revere. Um, on the other side, uh, you know, we'll have a whole multimedia room where we'll have every video every real video that's been on the internet, every television show that's ever been produced anywhere in the world available for anybody to come in and see. We'll have books to lend out to people in the community. We already have a, a sizable library and it's growing. 
And uh, we've got to, we were fortunate enough to acquire 2,000 copies of this book right off the bat for our library and for, and, and, all, and, and, for and for selling too even. But uh, you know, I, I can tell you, I had the pleasure of reading Steve's book back in September, I think it was. And uh, it was just, I, I was just overwhelmed by it and uh, you know, especially for a layperson like me who uh, had, is learning, had, never, never having been in a cult and have learned a lot about it and continue to learn stuff about it, this was a real, real help for me and it, it gave me a real insight into how uh, people like uh, Bill, and Lorna, uh, Bill and Lorna Goldberg, how they do their job, how Steve does his job and so many others who were out there, you know, extracting people from these organizations. And I, Power. Empowering people, that's right. And uh, in any case, there's some more questions here. It says, can you elaborate on the circumstances of Lisa McPherson's death? Uh, I assume that, uh, you know, I do make the assumption, maybe Steve was right, that uh, people do know about, that I think that people do know about her death and the circumstances, but maybe some of you don't. And uh, basically what happened with Lisa McPherson was that... Uh, She had, she went clear in Scientology, I believe it was in uh, July of 1995. And this, of course, is sort of the ultimate, one of the ultimate steps in Scientology. Now, there's always another ultimate step because they cost, each step costs money, and therefore you've got to keep the uh, treadmill going. But this is a very important one. Uh, in, within the organization. And Lisa continued to have lots of problems from July 95 through November. And the week before she was, uh, on November 18th, she was actually taken into the Fort Harrison Hotel for a 17-day a, a stay. But in the week before that, I'll tell you a little story that may give you some insight into how desperate this woman was and how potentially, and, and how clearly she was to Scientology as a major public relations risk. Uh, Lisa went with four other people, three other people from the uh, AMC Publishing Company, which is run by a, uh, one of the most uh, uh, Nazi-like women I've ever seen, a woman named Benetta Slaughter. And <clears throat> Benetta runs the, owns this company and she sent to Lisa and these other three people down to a trade show in Orlando. And Lisa was having all kinds of emotional problems during the drive down there, during the stay. She couldn't sleep at night. She was, uh, she was saying weird things to people that she never knew. She was talking about, uh, you know, that the world was coming to an end, that, uh, that uh, you know, you had to read Dianetics, the modern science of mental health, you know, just walking up to people that she'd never met in this trade show. One night she was so desperate, uh, at three o'clock in the morning, she jumps on a friend of hers who she was staying in the room with of 20 years, uh, a girl that she knew from Dallas from the time she was like 16 years old. And she's, she jumps on top of her in the, at three o'clock in the morning and she's holding the girl's hands with her hands, holding her down on the bed. Please help me, please help me. You've got to help me get through this. I am not going to make it. Well, this girl decided with her two colleagues uh, the next morning that they had to take Lisa back to Clearwater, to, <clears throat> to Clearwater, that she couldn't stay in Orlando for the weekend because she was, she was not in present time. She was, she was losing it. She was having some psychological problems. She was an embarrassment. They couldn't let her stay there. They drove her back, the, her friend, supposed friend, drove her back to Clearwater and delivered her into the hands of her ethics officer at AMC Publishing. The next day, she's taken into the Fort Harrison Hotel and stays for 17 days. She's held against her will. Well, here's a key thing. What happened is the first, uh, what happened is that Lisa got into a minor traffic accident. The theory is 
that Lisa escaped from the Fort Harrison Hotel after she was taken in earlier in the day. She got into this minor traffic accident. She wasn't hurt. The medics, uh, you know, examined her, but they wouldn't take her to the hospital, even though she said she wanted to go to the hospital. And the reason she wanted to go is she needed to talk to somebody. But she wasn't hurt, so they didn't. They wouldn't do it. So they get back in their ambulance, and she begins to take off her clothes and starts walking down the street naked. Now, this is a Scientology clear doing this in Clearwater, Florida. Now, can you imagine for the Church of Scientology how somebody who achieves the state of clear going down the street naked in Clearwater must look as a, an embarrassment to this organization? Well, that's really what it was all about, and that's why she ended up staying 17 days or being put into the Fort Harrison Hotel again. Now, one question I get asked a lot is, okay, well, she went to the hospital. They did take her to the hospital finally, but she voluntarily agreed to go back to the Fort Harrison with her friends from Scientology. Well, have you ever heard of uh, an abused wife uh, who gets the police on her husband? They come and, oh, everything is fine. You know, oh, no, there was no problem. There's no problem. You know, it's this type of total control that, that uh, an abusive organization has over an individual that caused Lisa McPherson to voluntarily, without raising any objections whatsoever, to go back to the Fort Harrison Hotel, to be held against her will for 17 days, to be dehydrated, to have cockroach bites all over her body. I mean, the, the, the medical experts now call these places on her body cockroach feeding sites. Now imagine that this girl had to be in a coma while this was going on. I mean, how do you allow cockroaches to feed on your skin uh, unless you're severely uh, incapacitated? So those are the only other things that I can elaborate on. Uh, there are a lot of autopsy photographs that have not been released. Uh, they have been seen, there are people even in this room, or at least one person in this room who has actually seen those photographs, the ones that haven't been released. Uh, there's at least two other people I know of who have seen them uh, going back two years ago. But uh, they show some pretty grim conditions of this woman's body that, that Scientology does not want the public to see. And she repeatedly asked to leave. Did she not at the beginning of her stay there? Yeah, she, she written she, in the records. Yeah, she not only at the beginning, but in the middle of her stay. But by the end of her stay, and you know, they did lose the last three days worth of records. Uh, you know, they just you know Scientology meticulous document keeping, but they lose the last three days of records for her stay at the Fort Harrison Hotel. I mean, it's just ludicrous. <coughs> It says, what kind of threats have Scientology uh, made to members of the Lisa McPherson Trust? <coughs> no, no direct threats. Um, but they make it really clear that uh, we're not welcome in their town. Uh, I think it was in the paper, one of the interesting quotes. One day I came to Clearwater and these two Scientology girls met me at the airport. What are you doing in our town? And I said, uh, Maybe this used to be your town, but we're here like, to help liberate it. <laughs> so, Bob, you should tell them what happened to Mark, though. Well, yeah, now, uh, there are some, uh, yes, I'm sorry, uh, Mark Bunker, who is the uh, man behind that big camera there. Uh, Mark is, you know, Mark really uh, deserves a, uh, some rec special recognition here because Mark has been a leader on the internet and putting video material on the internet for all to see. Uh, www.zenutv.com is his site. That's uh, X E N U T V dot com. Right. Uh, Mark has uh, digitized uh, every television show you can imagine that's ever uh, been on about Scientology and and. And there are many other things on there that don't have anything to do with Scientology. For example, uh, we put the wave on there too, as, uh, just so everybody could see it, and a few others, uh, a few other classics. But uh, <coughs> Scientology has uh, Mark went up to Chicago 
about a month or so ago, six weeks ago, to interview two dentists who were scammed out of so much money that you couldn't believe it. And they were upset and they wanted to talk about it on video in the process of getting their money back from the Church of Scientology. Well, there's, there are few things, I mean, you know, there are really few things that Scientology hates really bad. Number one, getting money out of the organization, and number two, getting a human being out of the organization. They go after you in a significant way in either area. Well, Mark was going up there to get this story on film, uh, along with many other uh, original documentaries that he's done about people in Scientology or experiences in Scientology, and let uh, the American Dental Association or anybody else who wanted to see this on Xenu TV have a, have a look at what happened to these two fine people in Chicago. Well, Mark goes with these people to the Chicago Org one night when they're going inside to collect some checks from Scientology. Mark's standing on a public sidewalk with the, the other two people, uh, the, the two dentists, uh, husband and wife, standing on the sidewalk uh, in front of the Scientology property. Mark is actually back a little bit from the sidewalk. Well, as soon as he gets there and starts filming, these two, as it turns out, off-duty police officers from the Chicago Police Department, out of uniform, come running out of the Church of Scientology's building, grab Mark's arms, one grabs one arm, one grabs his other arm with a camera in it, and throws him to the ground. And he gets arrested, and, and rough him up. He gets arrested for criminal trespassing. You know, he wasn't, I mean, the dentists have told the story on videotape of what happened there. It had nothing to do with Mark even remotely being on Scientology property. Well, now you would think that would be something that, uh, that would eventually get dismissed by the prosecutors in Chicago. Plus, Mark had a videotape of the whole event, of them running out of the place and hearing the video, the audio of what happened to him. Well, Mark went to Chicago this week on Wednesday. He went for a pretrial hearing. He gets there and four Scientology attorneys, together with four Scientologists from the Chicago Org, are lined up in the courtroom who have been chewing the prosecutor's ear all morning. And the, and the Scientology attorneys are led by Elliot Abelson. Now, Elliot Abelson, for, for 20 years, worked for the Mafia. He defended the Mafia in New York in the MyPorn investigation cases. He is a, his next client after the Mafia was the Church of Scientology. Well, Elliot is one of the nastiest guys they've got because of his connections in organized crime. So now he's in Chicago, all of a sudden he's the attorney helping the Church of Scientology get the prosecutor to add three more charges against Mark. You, you won't believe these charges. Battery on a police officer is one of the charges. Uh, resisting arrest, causing a public disturbance. I mean, what Mark has done for the world, really, is he has made he has shown Scientologists being Scientologists. And when I say that, what I mean is he has shown Sea Org people, OSA people, being Scientologists. As I said, I go back, you know, 95% of the Scientologists are good, decent people, but there is this element within Scientology that needs to be out. And those are the type of people running the types of operations that they did on Mark Bunker. Uh, and others that uh, you know cause us some degree of grief. So, but, but, but also just to, to say that uh, you know if you sign a billion-year contract, you know to work for a group for this lifetime and a billion years ahead, um, you're going to be very committed. And uh, um, I can tell you, I left the Moonies in 1976, but. My reference point was 1976, and if I was told that 
that uh, Satan was trying to, you know, destroy the true family, and that I had to go after. So I, I was trained in martial arts in the Monies, and the same kind of thinking of the ends justify the means, I think, um, are in play. Um, I have three questions I'll try to combine. Um, one question about educating mental health professionals. Uh, the person writes, uh, they're very discouraged because they have never found a mental health professional who knows about cults. And that with managed care, it's impossible to get even more people, mental health professionals, to take on uh, uh, patients. And another question about, um, what, do you have any tips on a church with a rigid, closed hierarchy that has abusive situations, how to try to uh, deal with that uh, so that they don't close ranks and, and it gets worse. And then someone must be a friend. So how can we get help get the word out about your book? <laughs> and I swear that I didn't ask this one. <laughs> but but I, had, I had these other two and I thought, hmm, what, how can I a a answer this question? And the, the truth of the matter is, is I wrote this book for several core audiences. One of them are family members and friends who have a loved one involved with a cult. But secondarily and primarily, mental health professionals and clergy and people in the helping, helping professionals, uh, professions uh, and as well as academics. And um, how can you get the word out about the book? I'd say start by reading it and, and, and thinking about what it is that I'm saying and what you like about it and what you don't like about it and what you agree with and what you don't agree with. And if you like it, Bob really liked it, I'm happy to say. Um, get some copies, give them to mental health professionals, or donate it to your libraries, or you know, start a, a awareness program. I'm certainly gearing up to do media. So if you are aware of places for me to come and speak, I'll certainly, you know, I want to go around the country and teach people about this approach. People want to learn how to be an activist and, and what to say if they're on a picket line or, or whatever. Um, and I'd like to uh, encourage people, if you like the book, then tell people about it. If you're on the internet, tell people on the chat rooms or go to Amazon.com, whatever. Uh, if you have a choice of buy, telling people to buy the book at Amazon or my site, please come to my site, freedomofmind.com, if you're on the web. Uh, it will help to defray some of the costs faster. Um, and uh, my hope is that we get enough religious leaders to stand up together to say, look, you know, we, we need to uphold human rights, and that we have to uphold a vision that people have a choice to belong to a group or a choice not to belong to a group. And that any group, just because they say they're a religion, um, needs to be held accountable for their behavior. There needs to be checks and balances. There needs to be some, some organizations that people can, can turn to to say, uh, help. And I'm hoping that efforts that, that Bob and other former members are making here, the Lear J. Ryan Foundation, yay to Julia. And <laughs> Let's work together to create awareness, and um, that, that's that's my response. Because I think that we will be able to uh, exert pressure on any group that wants to keep their tax exempt status or wants to have good PR. They're going to have to reform if they hope to to uh, gain new members. Otherwise, it'll be like Scientology losing members, losing, 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 losing members. There's one final question here that uh, I'd like to answer. It says, uh, what help uh, would you like from us? What can we do to help your organization increase awareness in Scientology? Well, the first thing that I would like to say, and this is uh, specifically aimed at uh, the Leo J. Ryan Educational Foundation, is putting on an, uh, an event like this is a really, really important thing. It is, uh, from my own experience, and maybe some share that, uh, it is sometimes lonely fighting these types of organizations. You, you become isolated. In fact, in Scientology, one of their policies is to isolate you as an individual from all possible uh, areas of support, emotional support, human support. Even. Um, 
And all of us here uh, are kind of in the same type of, quote, business of helping people. And I think uh, what we can do to help each other best, and, and I am very bad at this, but to, you know, this gives me the opportunity to challenge myself to reform, is that we need to be more in communication with each other. And you know, I know that uh, I, I take, especially last year when I came here to this conference, uh, you know, all of us who are now with the Lisa McPherson Trust were part of FactNet then. And, you know, we were in the middle of a, a long uh, battle with Scientology. Uh, we were being bashed on the internet at the time. Uh, we were involved, or I particularly was involved in a situation in terms of uncovering this Scientology spy that was made the situation very uncomfortable for me personally. Uh, but meeting, uh, or coming here with this group of people really made an incredible difference in my personal perception of how this community of, of people who are concerned about other human beings works. And it, it really recharged me last year, as I'm sure it will this year. And, you know, I, I thank everybody here for, uh, for doing that for each other all the time. And I think we just need to be in closer contact as the year goes on. Thank you. Thank you.